Let me go ahead and just welcome everyone for uh, to joining us for the Leadership ne Network webinar today, 10 Crucial Questions for 21st Century Discipleship Strategies. Uh, my name is Tim Nations. I'm the Director of Communication and Design for Leadership Network, and I am joined by uh, author, speaker, and Leadership Network Director, Reggie McNeil. And uh, we're grateful that you took some time out of your work week and the holiday schedule to join us as we're getting ready to dive in. I do want to cover a few housekeeping uh, type items. Here you can see just kind of a brief outline for today's webinar. We're going to spend some time on these 10 questions. Then we're going to open it up for some Q&A. Uh, we'll talk about how to do that here in just a moment. Uh, we're shooting for around 40 minutes or so. And uh, also today's webinar will be recorded. We'll be sending out a, a link and a follow-up email. So uh, if you want to watch that again, or for those that registered and missed, or if you'd like to share that recording with someone else on your team, then you're welcome to do that. Uh, one of the uh, challenges that uh, a lot of people run into in a webinar are audio challenges. And so if any time during the webinar there's an issue, you'll notice there's a tab up in the upper left where you can click on that and make any adjustments to your audio settings. Uh, also, as I mentioned, we will have a time of Q&A. And so next to that is the Q&A tab. Anytime during the discussion today, if you have a question, you can type that in there and uh, uh, we'll answer as many of those as we can at the end of our time. Uh, if you do have a uh, more of a technical issue, you can also ask that there. We've got some folks that are watching that and they'll respond via text to your question as well. Uh, there is a chat function and a raise hand function, uh, but because of the number of people that are a part of the webinar, we're not going to use those. We're just going to keep everything going through the Q&A tab. Um, so uh, as we get started, you know, one of the things that we've observed over the last 30 plus years working with influential leaders and growing churches is that a secret to success in the church is not a leader or a team's ability to always come up with the right answers, but rather their persistence in framing questions correctly. And I believe that's one of the reasons that Reggie is such a great resource to church leaders today, because for years, Reggie has been provoking church leaders to ask better questions. Uh, in fact, the subtitle for probably Reggie's most popular book published, I think about seven years ago, uh, The Present Future, is Six Tough Questions for the Church. So I can't think of anyone better to help us get at an issue that has been at the core of the church since the very beginning. And so today's webinar is about helping you to ask the right questions about discipleship in your church. It's really about framing a discovery process, a journey that we believe will lead to more effective discipleship for the people that God has called you to serve. And so we've asked Reggie to unpack 10 key questions that are critical to that discovery process. Uh, and for those of you who might wonder, these are not in any kind of sequence or order of importance. Uh, but what is important is that you and your leadership take the time to explore each of these questions in depth for your church and for your community. Uh, and so, Reggie, thank you for being with us today. Um, Reggie, you've been a part of the missional conversation for a oh, long time. Uh, yeah. Why is it that you're focusing time and energy on this topic of discipleship? Well, what we know is that a program church can be powered off of the resources of uh, people as long as they can continue just to pour people in there, people's time, money, res uh, skill sets, their talents, their energy. But a missional congregation really doesn't work absent missional people. And so the discipleship issue becomes really critical for uh, not developing a missional program, but actually having a missional culture where we are developing and deploying viral kingdom agents. And so that's been my uh, kind of draw into the discipleship discussion. And, and it's, uh, it's a, I think it's one of the two really green edges uh, of the church today, actually, this, this entire investigation. That's why I'm glad to be here today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Reggie. Well, I'll just let you dive right into these questions and uh, uh, unpack these a bit, and then we'll get into some questions from our audience. Sure, and uh, Tim's already set this up. 
Uh, for those of you who are looking for plug and play answers today, this is probably going to be uh, a little, um, uh, this, this webinar may be not fulfilling for you. I'm hoping though that you figure out through better questions, you're going to be doing a, a better search. For instance, you know, we often wonder what, or I, I do, or when I'm having consulting visits with clients, uh, you know, and we touch the area of discipleship, it's almost like it's, it, we're allergic to evaluating our assumptions about discipleship. And I think there are some, a couple of reasons I've picked up that are, are true and, uh, or, or feed into that reluctance. I think one is fear. Um, quite, cause, quite honestly, uh, a lot of us, we don't have ready answers. We don't have ones we're just waiting to try. Uh, and it seems so funny that, you know, this is the oldest command we we're given in terms of the church all the way back to the Great Commission, but we're still struggling with it. And I think it's uh, our inability to uh, have ready answers. Sometimes we just will keep doing what we've been doing. The second reason, I think, which also plays into that is the lack of experience of many church leaders. Many, many leaders on surveys about their own developments uh, say that they've never been, pastors particularly say, they've never been discipled. And what's interesting about our seminary training or whatever theological education you've had rarely deals with his, this is how you disciple. Uh, there's been the assumption that you're just going to go do this, but we don't, we've not had it done to us. And so we don't, uh, we don't know how to do it with other folks. I would suggest right off the bat that we are going to have to question some myths that we've been operating on some uh, operating assumptions that quite honestly haven't proven out. And the biggest one is that information itself is transformative. And, uh, and because typically our discipleship answers have always dealt with some curriculum, uh, some application of, of more Bible study or some more information. Now don't hear what I'm not saying right off the bat. I'm not suggesting information's unimportant, but its ability to transform us uh, and discipleship is a transformational process. But information by itself to transform just doesn't play out. I mean, I can read the side panels of cereal boxes uh, with a great deal of understanding. I understand fats and carbs and trans sugars and trans fats and all that kind of stuff. I still reach for Krispy Kreme donuts, you know, in the morning instead of, uh, you know, eating pine bark or whatever else it is I should be having for breakfast. But, uh, the, you know, it, I know information. It just doesn't move me to a different kind of level of behavior sometimes. So discipleship's all about moving into that transformational um, uh, space, which probably should take me to a, a second question, uh, assuming that we're uh, going to be, and I say a second, that would be nine on the screen in front of you. Um, and that is, I would ask yourselves as a team, uh, how do you generally start your discipleship processes? Do you start by developing a program, whether it's let's have a small groups ministry, let's develop another it, and then we go to recruit people to fill up our its, our small groups, our classrooms, our six-week study, our whatever it is. And uh, I would say typically in the program church, we develop programs and then we go into marketing and, and recruiting. But I'm going to ask you to do something far more difficult, uh, and it's very labor intensive, and it's to start thinking about people. How do you, uh, you know, create an atmosphere or, or an environment where an, uh, you are actually working with a person uh, or a family, some unit that, uh, you know, that, and you're crafting some kind of engagement for them uh, so it's really about the starting point. And I know uh, that can sound terribly naive, but I'm assuming that if we don't say, uh, question ourselves at this point, we'll just still keep cranking out plug and play discipleship programs and wonder why we don't have evidence that we're in a transformational environment. So I want to um, move, speaking of transformational environments, I want to move to the narrative issue because I think another thing for you to investigate as I say in question eight, is the underlying narrative that uh, is really uh, powering your discipleship efforts. In other words, if your underlying narrative is where well, we're just helping people get better, or for instance, I was recently at a client congregation uh, out west, 
the Pacific Northwest actually, and and uh, I listened to their annual meeting, and they were rehearsing um, their uh, their new ministry initiatives and some of their past year's uh, successes. And there are two big words in their mission statement, hope and compassion. And everything I heard was on the compassion side. Uh, and so, you know, we're helping hurting people who have lost a spouse or who've uh, been, you know, lost a job. Everything was compassion oriented. Nothing wrong with that. But as I visited with the staff and the elders later, I said, you know, uh, there's another part of your narrative, the hope. How are you helping people that uh, actually may not be, uh, you know, in some kind of disaster situation or crisis, but actually want to get better in their lives? Their families are, are okay. They're, they're enjoying life, but they would just like to accelerate their development. You know, we all need hope as well as compassion. And so what I'm suggesting uh, to you in this question is, as a team, Try to think, what is the narrative? Are, are you, uh, you know, are you just trying to meet needs or uh, are you trying to intercept people at their point of their pain? Or are you trying to elevate their idea about God and about, uh, or in some cases, I run into folks who see their discipleship efforts as ma mainly ways of helping people become better church members. What I would suggest is you think about the big narrative of scripture from the get-go is that each of us are made um, all of us and each of us are made in the image of God. And what if our underlying assumption or, or, uh, and, and also had a narrative to support it was that discipleship was a way of helping people grow into their own skins. In other words, if we are intentional, if we are intentional creations by God, then he must've had something in mind for our lives. Why not help people discover who they are and move toward that? And then that can take on, you know, whatever the need is, whatever the pain is, whatever the hope is, whatever the success is, whatever it is that people are dealing with. Just something to think about. But I would, I would evaluate what, what are we trying to get done in our discipleship? Because I think that really has a huge impact on the kind of discipleship processes then that we uh, script. I think I would uh, consider, uh, if I were you too, whether or not, and the next question would pick up on this, are, is everything like a regular plan program? In other words, if you want to be discipled, you need to be in our small group. It's at seven o'clock Sunday nights, or you need to be in a men's group, or you need to be in three different groups, or you need to be doing whatever process we put out on our website, you know, but you know, which would be kind of the old days of plan program, you know, where before we had the capacity uh, to, to customize our own uh, TV viewing or whatever. Is it possible and um, for you to begin your discipling process thinking from a point of view of not let's force everyone into the same uh, queue line at the same time for the very same experience but how far can we go in allowing people to customize their own journey? I will tell you that people are growing more allergic to our scripting their spiritual journey for them. I mean, you know, I grew up in that world. If you want to be a good disciple of Jesus, here's what you do. And most of it was very church centric. You know, you need to be a part of this and you need to participate in this and you need to belong to this. You need to attend this. Uh, you know, or you need to run the base paths or you need to be on certain kinds of committees or uh, all of that. People are growing um, more intolerant of someone scripting their journey. On the other hand, they will allow us to help shape their journey. And so that's really kind of the, the pitch that I'm making here. So let's think of that. If I can use that customization as the first element I want to talk about in this number six question as you think about the elements that you ought to have, uh, I, I think customization is, is, is critical. Uh, you know, can people, you know, how far can they go in participating in their own uh, recovery there? Can they say, well, here's what I really need over the next six months, or, you know, for the next year, I really need this. I mean, it's been my experience. I run into people who are in different stages of life, and some folks need something really immediate, really strong, really now really one-on-one, -on -one, really inter interventionist. But then other people move into seasons of life where they can share, uh, you know, with other people and, and more group settings or whatever. We've got, I think, to, I think we've got to allow for that kind of experience.
for people and realize that folks uh, are not static in their spiritual journeys and what actually fed their souls uh, three years ago uh, may not be the kind of environment that they really need right now. I think a second element that you probably want to investigate in terms of a discipleship culture is your intergenerational connections. Uh, you know, later on this afternoon, Leadership Network's ho hosting another webinar, and Kara from Fuller, Kara Powell, doing wonderful work there. And millennials, one of the things we know about millennials is they're wide open to the life wisdom of older generations, something that was not part, by the way, of my own generational. I'm a, I'm a boomer. That We didn't want to. You couldn't tell us anything. But these millennials are coming along, and and they're wanting the life wisdom of folks who've been around on the planet for a while. Well, how are you setting up in your discipling processes for more intergenerational kinds of uh, engagements? You know, I work with a lot of student pastors, uh, and I tell every one of them, you know, about, you know, just taking their, their high schoolers and their, their middle schoolers and, and releasing them like a tech squad, you know, a geek squad. Uh, to help older members of the congregation deal with stuff. It's just a way uh, of building those kinds of connections in. So uh, as you think about it, particularly the larger your congregation is, the more generationally siloed you tend to be. And uh, in the old world, uh, we all attended the same worship experience, and then we splayed off into generational silos for what we call religious education. What may be true in the, today's world is that our worship is very generationally um, you know, uh, culturally uh, more specific, but then we break off into our spiritual formation, religious education kinds of stuff in a more intergenerational culture. Just something to think about, just, just as, you, as you pursue developing the culture you want to have. I think, too, that you, we're going to have to be more life-centric than church-centric. I think helping people uh, not uh, just know how to navigate our church programmings and be participants which is the old scorecard, really, participation, if, P, if we move to a maturation scorecard, we're going to have to let people self-identify where it is they need to grow. Uh, and, and people, you know, don't, don't come to us in, their, uh, in silos of, or segmented lives. They bring their marriages, they bring their family, their workplace, their friends, their neighbor relationships. All that stuff comes with them. It comes with a package. And so this idea that we're going to do discipling kind of outside of life, I think we've got to figure out how we do this in the middle of life. And I think most of that then is going to force us into engagements with people uh, in other kinds of settings, maybe than you know, a church fellowship hall or even a living room of, of a bunch of uh, fellow Jesus followers who are all, uh, you know, looking in at each other. It may be that we're going to have to have a lot of micro church expressions, uh, we're going to have to have uh, ways for people to um, do what, you know, we would call asynchronous, ubiquitous kinds of discipling, anytime, anywhere, access to resources on our website, all that kind of stuff. I think, too, that service has been long underplayed as a spiritual discipline, and I think a lot of people grow the fastest when they are engaged in helping other people. Uh, there's a reason that love your neighbor as yourself is part of Jesus' command to us. And so I think discipling, uh, just think about this in your own discipling process, how much of it is just consumer, like the person's getting something, but, you know, how much of it is service oriented? And I would recommend that you up the, the ante there. I think folks find out a lot about themselves when they're helping other people. Now, they don't do it automatically. And that brings me to my fifth point. Uh, or fifth bucket you need to have in terms of a, not the, the next question, I'm sorry, but, but the, the fifth uh, component of a transformational environment. And that is, uh, you know, it's got to be a coaching. Uh, and, and actually, I'll, I'll move to this slide since we're talking about it. The, people don't automatically make the, make the connections, the dots. Uh, they don't connect the dots over their life experience. Um, without some kind of environment that helps them do that. And so I think that, you know, when I say part of the environment has to be a coaching, I think it also answers this question. Uh, you know, people need to make sense out of the experiences that they are having. You know, John Seal made a presentation at our last Discipleship Hub experience, and, uh, and he talked about the old world where 
the order of, of, of things was, you know, head, heart, and hands. It's a fascinating analogy or metaphor he was using. We used to take in information, make sense of it, and then apply it. He's suggesting that in the new world, and I think he's absolutely right, it's in exactly a reverse order. It's hands, heart, head. In other words, we experience life. We somehow need, you know, to make sense out of it or process it. And only then are we able to file it in systems that will influence further, uh, further kinds of behavior and how we'll respond in the future to the same situation. It seems amazing to those of us who have lived in the old world that people don't automatically build file systems for the information and their life experiences. But I can tell you that, uh, you know, even people that work on church as millennials and youngerlings who are awash in information need help with the judgment call of what do I do with all this information? What pieces should I be paying attention to? What is it about my behavior that I need to, uh, to investigate and maybe shift in order to have a different result than the result that I've already been getting? It's uh, the last group that I had in our discipleship uh, journey together at the Hub. Uh, we, we were at a church that had a CrossFit uh, box and um, training area. So I took the group up there, and it was fascinating to listen to that CrossFit coach talk about how people's lives are transformed in that experience. Now, I will tell you, I was not personally moved to become part of a CrossFit training program. Um, and if you could see the rest of me, you would probably recommend that for me. But, uh, but, but what was fascinating is all of the elements that made that such a transformational environment. And, and, and it's behavior based. I mean, you don't get to come into a CrossFit training area and watch other people work out and feel healthy about yourself. I mean, that's a lot of church stuff. You know, people come in and watch you work out and then they feel better. Are you kidding? I mean, you've got to, you've got to actually get on these machines, uh, you, but you have a lot of people cheering for you. You've got accountability. You've got community, which, by the way, we've discovered we as if I was part of it. But in all of the research coming out now about um, uh, recovery and, and um, recovery programs and all of that, community is the number one correlative to people's ability to deal with addictions, life transformation. In other words, we weren't built to do this by ourselves. And think about how much of the discipling process in our church is, is you know, an individual consuming information and expecting something different to happen. Community is so critical. Now, that does, community doesn't mean, because you don't get automatic community in a small group with 12 other people. I can tell you some of the most non-communal experiences I've had have been sitting in a room with a bunch of people I'm supposed to be having community with. It does, community doesn't develop like that. Uh, you know, in the church, we form these circles that all look at each other, but community in the world often happens shoulder to shoulder. We're watching something together, a movie, or we're watching our kids play together, and uh, or we're working on a project together, and that's how community forms in the real world out there. Well, how are we building that into our discipling? Okay, I've been on this question too long. Uh, let's go. Let's move to another one. I, I maybe I can think of something else to say. Um, <laughs> one question I would ask you to ask yourselves is: Are we going to force people to become church members or somehow become part of our church constellation uh, before they are um, actually uh, included in our disciple making? I'm suggesting that everywhere. And let's go ahead and roll the next question because I've been talking a long time here because it's connected to that. And, and that is, you know, the number of people that we may be encountering uh, with our church ministry and particularly service projects and all of that, uh, these are folks that are not susceptible to being congregationalized. They really don't want to give up their Sunday or, or they really don't have a Sunday or their, their life rhythms don't match our congregational life rhythms. We've got to figure out how do we impact people and disciple folks that we are, you know, involving in our service project, uh, you know, both the recipient and the person that's giving the help or, or whatever else, just as an example, or someone who, you know, downloads their sermon or, 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 or however they are engaging us, you know, are we okay with the fact that our people can be discipling 40 times the number of folks that show up here on Sunday, just because they are, 
so good. And we, I mean, we've developed a culture where they're being developed and they automatically then at their workplace, in their neighborhoods, uh, in their book clubs, uh, with their work teams, you know, are doing the same thing with folks in their world. Can we celebrate that without, uh, you know, saying, well, now if they really want to get serious, they need to be part of our other stuff here as well. Tim, how much longer do I have? Because I've got two more questions. Do I have time for two more? Yeah, we're good. we got a few more minutes. All right, okay. I mean, I, really, that was not a question. I was just seeing if you were still awake. All right. I'm um, the, <laughs> the second thing, uh, the second question I'd say is, um, how do we help people know they're developing? This is often the most fundamentally overlooked component of discipling, it seems to me. People want to know that they're growing. And, uh, I mean, that's really what makes that CrossFit, that was one of the key things about the CrossFit training uh, place there, box, I guess. Is that is it a box, Tim? I know you're a CrossFit guy. Yeah, uh, we call it a box, Reggie. Yeah, well, we, we were trying to think in the box that day. And so the in, in that box, you, you, you have goals, you're keeping up with progress. Well, I know that uh, since I talk about scorecard a lot, you know, can we help people identify the areas of their growth and then ask them, uh, you know, or chart them or go back and say, well, how's that working? Uh, you know, are you growing in that area? It's, it's, it's interesting to me that our folks will go to the doctor for an annual physical or their dentist for you know, every six months for teeth cleaning or whatever else. When do we ever have conversations with our folks about their spiritual journeys? We assume this is happening in our small groups. We assume that people are that. Don't make the assumption. What if one of your key things was to ask folks, because, I mean, people are kind of in touch with some of the stuff that's going on in their life. They don't need us to tell them, you know, what to think about it. They can actually say, I'd like God's help uh, with this particular issue in my life over the next six months or over the last 12 months. Well, if you ask that question, then you have to, you know, go back and say, well, how's that working? Uh, you know, uh, here's what we did. Here's what we meant with you or helped you construct as your path as a Jesus follower to, to make some progress in that area. How's that working for you? I mean, wouldn't it be fascinating, uh, you know, to actually have our folks cared for in such a way that, that they were able to report their growth in certain areas? People are motivated by growing. And if our discipleship processes are just participation processes, then it's like running up and down the basketball court, throwing the ball up against the backboard, but never knowing when you score. That gets tiring and people drop out, which brings me to my last question. It's directly connected to this one. And that is if a person, you know, how can a congregation know about their success? And I'm going to say that we are right back to the first question. If you build this discipleship culture around people, then your only true scorecard is how many people that you're intersecting believe that their lives are being transformed in some way. Now, I'm not saying that you set up the template and that you assign so many points for daily Bible reading or whatever else there is. Let people participate in their own recovery and say, I'm making progress. I'm a better spouse. I'm a better you know, dad. I'm a better worker. I'm a better employer. I'm a better neighbor. I mean, you know, we, we could help people in big buckets like their relationships and um, their outlook on life or maybe their personal development, chart those things out, then let them, uh, you know, declare how they're doing because the, in the CrossFit box, again, the coach, just because he can roll through his routine, uh, you know, uh, doesn't mean that it's been a very successful CrossFit experience for the people in the room. It's actually linked to their own successes. And so I'm suggesting and challenging those of us who are in spiritual arenas, who have organizations, and, and we're managing, you know, enormous, uh, in, for some of you, enormous uh, cultures with thousands of people. You know, do we have the courage to link ourselves to one by one by one, or are folks feeling like they're growing, or do we just keep the old scorecard of this is how many people participated in our stuff last year, and then we assume that they are somehow are growing? All right, I can't take any more of me. I've heard myself all I can stand, uh, and probably everyone out there, the, the last two people that are still on may have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good stuff, Reggie. Yeah, we, we do have some questions. Um, there are several questions that have been asked uh, about some of the specific content pieces, and just as a reminder, 
this is being recorded. We will get a link out to you. Uh, so if you came in late or you missed one of the points, uh, we'll be able to have that to you so that you can review it and get all that content uh, from Reggie. Um, but uh, one of the questions that we received was about um, you know, the difference in our American context. As we look at discipleship in the Bible versus the context that we have today in America, you know, what are the key differences that leaders really need to pay attention to as they're uh, trying to develop those environments and this journey for their people? Wow, such a great question. I do, and I could actually have uh, discussed this. I had my notes to talk about on that very first question of why we're a little reluctant to evaluate our assumptions. You know, we're Westerners, and in, uh, and in our Western culture, it's so consumer-oriented that it's difficult for us sometimes to step out of that paradigm, uh, you know, even when we think about discipleship. We're still thinking about what can we give people? What can they get? You know, what can they access? What can they acquire? And the truth of the matter is it's about relationships and community and accountability. And it really is countercultural uh, for folks uh, to, you know, want to be um, in a transformational environment often. I mean, there's a reason I resist the CrossFit box because I, I just really don't want to do that. So, but in the area of, of, uh, of our spiritual journeying, um, I think your questioner, or those of you who raised that, you're, you're right. You're up against a consumer culture. And the only thing I know, the only thing ultimately I know that helps us bust through that is that our, our needs, our motives have to overcome. There's got to be something pushing on me that forces me like my pants won't fit anymore or something like that finally pushes me to do something different. And, um, and I don't know if in our culture, if that is being confronted with the pain of other people, confronting our own pain, but I think we have to somehow create, it, people just are not automatically say, yeah, I want to be more and more of a Jesus follower. I think we have to, we have to constantly somehow bring ways of putting a little bit of, of kind of tension in that system so that people realize, you know, there is a better life. I'm just not experiencing it. You know, and everything may be great in my life. I'm, it may not be addiction uh, that, or, or anything else, but I, somehow I just still feel a little empty. I think we have to increase that tension uh, so that people are, are driven to look for other uh, for solutions. Good. Yeah, another question, Reggie, um, and, and I'm going to um, add just a little bit to this, um, but the question is, how can we create or facilitate experiences? So how can we get people hands-on in things um, that are meaningful and make the relevant connection to life transformation? Uh, and, and this was, um, you know, this was uh, particularly uh, asked in terms of millennials who, you know, their, their time, uh, the obligations and responsibilities that they have. And I would also add that, who are involved in a lot of benevolent works that may right. not be, you right. know, that may not be kingdom related. So right. how, how can leaders create experiences that can help make that connection? Well, the first thing I tell folks is you have got to build in this reflection into the experience itself, not as a follow up two weeks later, because folks have moved on to 30 other experiences. I think we give too little attention to debriefing those experiences right then, right there, right when it happens, because that's the point, and particularly millennials, but really all of us are geared that way. What did we just learn? What did we just confront? Like, you know, uh, after feeding, uh, let's say someone's involved in uh, homeless feeding for the evening, what, what did we, what fears did we have to face in ourselves? What biases were uh, at play in, in us as we engaged with the homeless population, say, or, or what did we learn about ourselves? What did we learn about God's work in the lives of these folks through our conversations? Did we even have any conversations with, with folks or were we just glad to get out of there? I mean, it seems to me that we need to do a much better job of, of, of crafting and shaping uh, reflection uh, times and debriefing from all of these experiences as they're happening. And then we need to be able to move in with the, well, well, what's next question, you know? So if you want to do something, if you've just made this discovery about yourself, how, how do you think 
how would you want to go about uh, following up with that? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, in one of the words, in other words, Tim, what I say to folks is, you're not through with a mission trip, you're not through with a service project until you have the debriefing conversation. You know, don't even think you know that you're you're done because that's that's where we've got to help people make the connections. I'm repeating myself, but okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Well, you know, one of the I guess million dollar questions in discipleship is, uh, you know, how do you know that what you're doing is working? You know, what are what are the things that you know, or or maybe maybe I'll phrase it this way: a couple different questions that were asked about this, but. How do leaders go about ensuring that the things that they're measuring are the things that are that are producing growth in people? Well, you know, I'm, this is going to sound so fundamental, uh, but I think we I think we let people tell us. Now, I know there's some folks listening that know that. I mean, people. I mean, you ask me a question. We're, people are going to lie like dogs. I mean, you know, if this is part. I mean, surveys and all that. But over time, if you build a culture where people are self-reporting that they are experiencing some kind of, you know, life growth or, or they may be experiencing increasing, uh, you know, tension in their lives in some areas, I just think we under-ask our people for their own feedback about how they think they are doing. We make assumptions about how we think they're doing. And our only problem is we don't know they've got a problem until they come to us with a problem. Uh, you know, so why not set up a way that people can, it doesn't have to be individual. I mean, the technology exists, you, you know, this, this stuff can roll up to leaders on, you know, uh, in aggregate kinds of information. If we, if we are aware and we just did our, you know, quarterly survey of folks about top 10 issues in their life or top three, and we've got a thousand people out there that are reporting that they're struggling in their marriage. You don't have to go on a, you know, a vision quest uh, to figure out what do we need to be doing as a staff around here? What should the next sermon series be? I mean, you know, our own folks are quite capable of telling us stuff about their own lives. We just need to ask more. Reggie, uh, how, how would you recommend, you know, you made the point that, um, you know, churches need to look at, uh, you know, are they, are they focusing on programming? Or are they focusing on people development? Um, what are, are there some recommend, recommendations you would have to help churches begin to shift away from programmatic to more of the people development? How, how can they, um, yeah. what can they look at to help them do that? I think the key thing, and I, I, you know, I just thought as you were asking that question about a response to the last question, it was better than the one that I gave. But and I'll give much better responses after the, we're through with the webinar to all these questions. But I think the the same question is we we have to figure out a way that we let people, and in other words, I let's just say if our major narrative is that we're helping people become the person God wants them to be, then what that means is we don't template what discipleship looks like for them. You see, I, every, every group comes in and that's the first thing we want to do. We want to, we want to draw a picture of a disciple. Let me tell you what a disciple looks like. A disciple looks like Tim, you know, it looks like Stephanie. It looks like Susan. It looks like George. And we aren't templated. Now, there are some areas that we all share, like relational health, emotional health, physical health. But this thing about us setting up a checklist of these 12 things make you a great disciple, are you kidding? I mean, that, I mean how, how non-honoring uh, to God's creative genius uh, is that? So whatever process it is that you have to develop or interchange, whether it's uh, digital or face-to-face, -face, or in groups, or however you get it done, I think people need to identify their own areas of growth, their own areas where they feel like they're doing okay, realizing that you're not the judge of this. But over time, you know, believing that the Holy Spirit is an ongoing coach with them, uh, that, but just by setting up the environment where they're constantly having to, to reflect on their own journey, uh, is going to get us better information and help them pay more attention to the life they're they're leading. It doesn't take anything away from teaching. We ought to teach about what a good neighbor looks like, uh, but that's just to hold up 
ways of helping our people imagine how they could be who they are better in neighboring relationships, for instance. Well, Reggie, one last question. We're ending the near, uh, nearing the end of our time. This was asked by a few different people, and it really has to do with um, the older members and leaders in the congregation um, and, and a couple of different things. You know, how do you, how do you keep them engaged in uh, spiritual growth, spiritual development, uh, and, and, and perhaps even in one ask, you know, how do you, how do you help them see the need for change in the way that we're doing discipleship? Well, this is an oversimplified answer because, but that's a generic question because, you know, here we are older people, you know, uh, but I can tell you that the folks that I see come alive are folks that are introduced to new ways of helping other people. I see folks in their 70s are living, uh, you know, I've got a friend watching this. Um, yeah, I think he's watching. He told me he was. Uh, that's how he's a friend. Uh, but, um, you know, and, and he's in his mid-70s and he's having the time of his life uh, because he's, you know, he's engaged in serving people and he helps other people that want to pursue their their journeys. He helps them by supporting their work. And so I, I think really uh, if, if, if we start out in life learning as children uh, that the most joyous things we do are sharing and giving, I think we come back to those childlike simplest things. And I know that's an overgeneralization, but I can tell you, I, people, all I can say is the people that are engaged in other people's lives in genuine serving capacity, they are fully alive. And it's the folks that are sitting around in their own soup, uh, just focused on their own uh, stuff that are the most miserable. Hmm. Yeah. Good stuff, Reggie. Well, as we, as we wrap things up, we want to uh, be respectful of, of everyone's time. I do want to thank you all for joining us and Reggie as well for helping us sure. unpack these questions. You know, often what we get after various online events is the question, how can I learn more? And so, uh, everyone that's on the webinar can visit our website, leadnet.org, and there you'll find a variety of blog papers, uh, blog post papers, other resources on discipleship, as well as uh, many other important topics for the church today that you can download and have access to. Uh, but for those of you that are looking for something more, if you visit the URL that's up on the screen, leadnet.org slash discipleship, you can learn about our year-long intensive team-based experience that uh, Reggie alluded to before. It's called Hub, uh, and Reggie is directing our Hub Discipleship Group. Churches that apply and qualify for Hub gain exposure and access to leading thinkers, to uh, ministry practitioners, all in the discipleship arena, as well as some other models outside of the church, uh, like CrossFit boxes and other things that have principles for reproduction and life change that uh, can be helpful for church leaders. Uh, these teams are led through our proven process of moving from ideas to implementation to impact, and, and all of this is done alongside other teams that are on a similar journey in an environment that accelerates learning and multiplies impact over a 12-month period. Um, our next Hub Discipleship group launches February 21st through the 23rd. It's hosted at Mariner's Church in Irvine, California. Uh, and I can't think of a better place than Southern California to be in February. Exactly. Uh, but we hope you check it out. We hope to see some of you there. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks again for joining us, and we will see you next time.